Hello Penguin Arts, I'm the Baby Penguin and welcome back to Kerbal Space Program Beyond Kerbal. This episode, the constellation is arriving at the wasteland, but first we need to make a small correction burn to insert ourselves into the correct orbit before we do the painfully slow process of actually getting into orbit. Because if you recall, we're using an open cycle nuclear engine, which while extremely efficient is rather low thrust. So. This episode's full of quite a few very long burns that I've sped up to eight times speed. So as we enter the sphere of influence of the wasteland, you see here, we can grab ourselves some scientific readings. Although we're not actually getting any science directly from those since we've taken them beforehand on our previous mission, Odyssey, which went to the wasteland briefly, we can put the data from those into our science lab. Now we're actually using a new science lab that we just unlocked, the Advanced Mobile Processing Lab, and that actually produces a fair bit more science per unit of data that we put into it, but the uh, side effect of that is it is also much slower at researching the same amount of data. Thankfully though, the more data you have in a science lab, the faster it researches and the more science it produces every day. And whereas the normal science lab can store about 500 units of data, this science lab can store over 9,000. So we don't need to keep all of our sort of copies of experiments stored because we can just dump all of them straight into the science lab. And over the course of this episode, uh, we'll be slowly filling up that uh, science lab's data storage capacity and hitting some pretty insane amounts of science per day. So you can see here we've activated our engine quite far out from uh, our periapsis here. In fact, uh, <laughs> this was an hour long burn that we had to do. Uh, and we're having to sort of strike a balance here between actually reducing our velocity and also making sure that we're not reducing our periapsis height because we don't want to slam into the atmosphere of the wasteland. That would not end particularly well. So I'm just going to sort of skip through some parts of this burn. Uh, you see we're getting a rather beautiful view of the wasteland's rings, which were created, for those of you who don't know, by the collision between Minmus and the moon creating a sort of amalgamation of the two, uh, which is now the wasteland's solitary moon named Malice, which we will be visiting later on in the episode. So what we did is here is we actually um, changed our maneuver. So I realized actually we don't need to waste Delta V putting this entire spacecraft into a low orbit around the wasteland because we're going to be heading to Malice first. So what we're just going to do is insert ourselves into an orbit, which is essentially a Malice transfer orbit. Bit. And then we're going to ditch that massive fairing at the top, which is 120 tons worth of mobile base. And that's going to descend down to the surface of the wasteland, so use the atmosphere to slow down. If we are in an even higher orbit, then uh, we'd be going too fast and burn up on atmospheric entry. So this is a basically pushing the limit of uh, <laughs> of how much energy it can have when it slams into the atmosphere. And then we're going to send the rest of the spacecraft off to Malice and explore that before then leaving Malice, heading down into a low orbit around the wasteland and then sending our crew down to the mobile base. So you see here we've inserted ourselves almost into the right orbit. We had to do a little burn here just to uh, make sure we don't encounter Malice while we're orbiting around because what we want to do is drop the mobile base near the old Kerbal Space Center so that we can drive over to it uh, in a future episode once our crew is down in the base and we can explore it. That requires us to actually arrive within a pretty slim window of land. Uh, so we had to orbit around a few times before it lined up properly. And then we're having to do a maneuver here to adjust uh, the longitude of our periapsis to make sure we enter the atmosphere at the correct point because the continent where the Kerbal Space Center is actually located is quite thin and either side of it is searing hot lava. And if our base lands in that, then, well, I mean, first of all, even if it wasn't searing hot lava, you know, it wouldn't be able to move because it uses <laughs> wheels. Uh, but yeah, it's not going to really be in a solid form for very long. I remember our last uh, lander that landed on the wasteland, the Phoenix, since it actually ran out of fuel on ascent, we had our Kerbals leap out and just about make it into orbit using their EVA packs, and that slammed down into <laughs> on the lava oceans and very promptly got vaporized. Uh, we don't really want that happening to our extremely expensive <laughs> mobile base. So now we've used all the Delta V in that little uh, lower stage there uh, and we put ourselves into an orbit which is going to intersect the wasteland's atmosphere. We can ex 
extend our inflatable heat shield and descend into the atmosphere. And we have some very strong reaction wheels uh, on this base, so we are actually managing to point it. And we also made sure that all of the nuclear fuel and everything was down near the bottom, so the uh, actual uh, center of mass is pretty far forward, so it manages to remain stable throughout the atmospheric entry process. Although you see there, we did push some of those temperature sliders near their maximums, but thankfully uh, our orbital speed was just about low enough for this whole thing to survive the entry process. And then what we do is we eject our heat shield and we eject that massive 20 ton fairing and we deploy some drogue chutes. Now the temperature of the actual atmosphere is too high for normal parachutes. They actually burn up. Uh, so you can only use drogue parachutes on the wasteland. So we have to land propulsively using a pair of vector engines which thankfully make it very easy to maintain our attitude and we land relatively softly on the surface. You can see just extending our radiators there to radiate some of the heat that we did accumulate during that atmospheric entry. And there we have it. You finally see our mobile base in its full glory. Of course, the engines and the fuel pods are going to come off once we get some Kerbals down there to disassemble some parts of it. And we are going to populate it with two scientists, a pilot and an engineer. And they are going to explore all the various different biomes and actually mine resources from a couple of different biomes to make it fully self-sufficient on supplies. But that will be in a future episode. For now, we're just boosting our orbit back up a little bit. <laughs> the uh, spacecraft mass is now halved <laughs> by getting rid of that mobile base. Uh, so yeah, just, just how much... Um just how much of this mission has basically been built around that massive great big thing, uh, that um, Akira base. But thankfully... Our nuclear engine has essentially made this entire uh, mission possible. Just to get an idea of how efficient that engine is, all of its fuel for this whole mission is contained in that lower section. You see where those spherical fuel tanks are near the back? That's all of the fuel for that engine. All the rest of that is either monopropellant or fuel for our SSTO. You see that the fuel for our SSTO, which is going to have to make two trips in total down to the surface and back up again, uses like twice the amount of space and mass as uh, the fuel for the essentially the entire interplanetary transport um, engine, which I just find amusing. Uh, it's just, uh, yeah, it's an interesting visualization of just how efficient that engine is and how inefficient, I guess, the engines on our SSTO are by comparison. So you see, uh, we're inserting ourselves into orbit around Malus here. And we have actually been to Malus orbit before. It's a similar thing, we've been to uh, Wasteland orbit before. Um, which is why we're not actually getting any science or even any research data when we're trying to take some uh, some of our scientific readings here. Because if I think if you recovered the scientific experiment back on Solitude, um, then if you put that um, experiment into a research lab you don't get any data for it so it's only experiments that we haven't actually previously recovered that we're getting data for here but thankfully we've never landed on malice before so we're going to be getting a lot of data from each of the different biomes but Beardy how are you possibly going to land in all the different biomes that lander on the side can't possibly have enough delta v well it doesn't it actually only has just enough delta v to uh, descend to the surface or get into orbit or hop uh, about a quarter of the planet's circumference to another biome but it is an aluminium liquid oxygen hybrid rocket now aluminium of course is a solid fuel and liquid oxygen is a liquid oxidizer so although it is a solid um, fuel that we're using since the oxidizer is a liquid we can still throttle it so why are we using this uh, interesting engine well malice is actually covered in alumina it's relatively abundant in every single biome. So we've strapped some massive drills on the side and an electrolysis lab. And what we're going to be doing is extracting alumina from the surface, refining it into aluminium and oxygen, and using it as rocket fuel to refuel the lander every single time it lands. So even though the actual performance of this rocket is really quite poor with regard to ISP and also its minimum thrust is uh well it certainly makes things difficult in this episode i mean you saw there on the descent uh, it, it has to actually um, be a certain minimum thrust value to be activated um, and that's actually higher than the acceleration of the moon so uh, we can't gently touch down we have to keep sort of doing suicide burns throughout the <laughs> entire uh, course of this episode which uh, certainly stressed me out a bit and i'm sure it'll stress out some of you when you see some of the crazy maneuvers we pull later but we get lemor our pilot out when he plants a flag aluminium power is written on the plaque 
and we grab ourselves all of our relevant scientific reports. And now what we can actually do is uh, take advantage of the new Breaking Ground expansion. Now, although we don't have any of the surface features added by Breaking Ground, which would be freaking awesome, but uh, it does require games links um, to actually <laughs> make them compatible with each of his planets in the After Kerbin planet pack, and possibly even an update to Copernicus, which is the uh, mod that allows the creation of all of these uh, customized planets. Uh, and also it would require a change to our save file, and anyway, unless Games Links puts a lot of effort in and a few different mod developers possibly uh, put a bunch of effort in, we're not going to be able to get all the wonderful surface features uh, on all of these planets, but we can get out our deployable science. So you see there we've got an ionographer analysing ions um, and assume uh, I <laughs> assume it studies the uh, solar wind as well, which is certainly of interest this much closer to Archangel. Perhaps we can get some more insight into uh, the rate of expansion and how much time we have left before solitude becomes uninhabitable. We of course also have a mystery goo observation thingy and then we get out two of our um, RTGs to power all our experiments. Now since uh, we actually leveled up our crew and our engineer there, Kagar Kerman, is actually level 4, it turned out we only needed one uh, of those RTGs. I tested this mission with a level 3 engineer so they only produce three power units there so we needed two of them but uh, since he's since leveled up um, <laughs> during the mission uh, we only needed one but there's no point carrying around uh, the extra RTGs in those cargo pods on the side of the lander, it's just extra mass to be lugging about so we might as well just deploy them. So you can see here we're getting two copies of each of our experiments. So one set of experiments to actually take home with us and uh, recover back on Solitude and the other set of experiments to put into our lab which we can then use to research and produce an appalling amount of science. I mean <laughs> honestly labs are, I, I mean I don't really want to say broken just because um, if you would on, it's on our, at least on our difficulty setting, if you were just getting science from recovering uh, science reports, then I don't think you would even be able to finish the tech tree um, just from recovering reports from probably every single experiment from every biome of every planet in the solar system. That's, cool. <laughs> That's just a, a visualization of how hard our difficulty settings are and also just how much science it takes to complete the interstellar tech tree. I honestly don't think we're going to complete the interstellar tech tree, tech tree before we even go into stellar. Um, because you know the fusion engines that we're actually going to use to go into Stellar are uh, a little bit um, toward, well, not quite at the end of the actual tech tree. But you can see here we've begun our alumina drills and we're refining it, electrolyzing it into aluminium and liquid oxygen. Aluminium is probably surprising to a lot of you uh, in the fact that it can be used as a rocket fuel. We tend to think of it as a very unreactive metal, but that's actually because it's extremely reactive, and so it develops a surface coating of aluminium oxide, or alumina as it's called, um, and that's not reactive at all. So aluminium actually instantly reacts with the air around it. That creates a very thin layer of aluminium oxide, and then that protects the aluminium underneath it from reacting, which makes it unreactive and uh, also non-corrosive as well uh, which is very useful but if you strip away that aluminium oxide layer aluminium actually is extremely reactive so reactive in fact that you can as you see here use it as a rocket fuel which is really rather exciting it has some interesting prospects um, for creating aluminium hybrid rockets for use on the moon because that also has large deposits of alumina across its entire surface I mean this whole mission was basically inspired I I'm sure many of you seen Scott Manning's interstellar quest I mean, this series has sort of been an attempt by me to improve upon that whole project uh, that he did. But uh, he made a spacecraft called the Outland, which explored the surface of the moon in a very similar manner to this and using an aluminium hybrid rocket um, and refueling at points across the surface of the moon and using it to explore all of its biomes. You can see there we landed on uh, quite a sharp incline so you had to wait for the Miranda lander to actually roll, well not roll, slide down the hill before it came to uh, a stop before we could get our Kerbals out. You can see here, it's getting out a different one of our Kerbals because they actually get experience for planting a flag um, on a body so we wanted to make sure that each of them gets the opportunity to plant a flag. You see there. Made possible by Jade of Ma. You see, this planet didn't, well, not planet, moon, didn't actually have Illumina all over it in the res uh, resource config files. I had to actually make a config file myself. That's just because Games Links hasn't made a community resource pack uh, config files for any of his planets because uh, he doesn't have any experience with it in the past. But this 
body is supposed to have Illumina all over it. So I had to make my own config file to uh, define each of the biomes and make sure that they each have Illumina in them. Turns out though that uh, our difficulty setting that we're on reduces resource abundance to 50%, which also affects the presence chance. So I was setting 100% chance of having Illumina present, and then our difficulty settings in this save file were actually reducing that to 50%. So uh, it took quite a while to figure out why uh, <laughs> there wasn't any Illumina on Malice. Uh, so thankfully, um, Games Links directed me towards someone who's got a lot of experience with the Community Resource Pack mod, um, Jade of Mar, and he helped me out, and we uh, we figured out a few things. Also, it turns out that uh, KSP Interstellar has its own resource config files that were, <laughs> that were actually... Um, clashing with the resource config files from um, well, the community resource pack itself. So uh, yeah, we figured out quite a few bugs uh, and I actually tidied up my install quite a bit uh, in the process. So thanks to him and that plaque is now going to read thank you to him. So you can see there we've deployed our second set of deployable experiments. We only brought two, mainly just because well, we only had so much room in those two cargo containers on the side. I'm really quite happy with how this land had turned out, with how compact we managed to make it and fitting all the experiments and boxes and the like into uh, really quite a small sort of frame and basically building it around this aluminium engine because uh, as I said, the ISP of this engine is very low. It's really quite a crappy engine. We wouldn't be using it at all if it weren't for the fact that it's fueled by aluminium, uh, you know, obviously something we can harvest very easily on this particular body. Uh, so yeah, most of the lander is just fuel. Um, if we had a liquid fuel oxi uh, oxidizer um, rocket, it would have significantly more delta V. Um, but again, um, we have way more delta V because the fuel is all over the moon that we've actually landed on. But yeah, I think it's turned out really nicely, especially using those B9 landing legs, uh, the heavy landing legs there. I think they really look pretty cool. It's sort of got like a, I don't know, chunky, compact sort of look, uh, which I think really works. So now we've finished exploring the upper Midlands, we're going to head over just to the next valley. I went a little bit Welsh there. <laughs> I have a Welsh family, okay, I can make fun of the accent. Um, and we head over to the lowlands, and so we can get even more science. Manas actually has a total of five biomes on it, but uh, don't you worry, we are going to start flying through them soon, because we're pretty much doing exactly the same thing in each individual biome. But uh, we get a really nice view here. You see here, we've got the lander there, and then we've just sort of got the mouth of the valley. And as we look up, you can see the wasteland in all its glory just above us. Which I think really does look quite beautiful and will probably be the thumbnail. Uh, I'm sure you guys know at this point, but I haven't actually made the thumbnail yet. So, uh, yeah, <laughs> that almost certainly is the thumbnail this video, though. And we just put a little description. All this hopping is making me dizzy because we are literally just refueling the rocket and then just hopping straight over to the next biome. And we're taking uh, less time in each biome now because we've deployed all of our deployable science. Um, but I think we get diminishing returns from deploying more sets of experiments in different biomes. I think the more biomes you deploy them in, uh, it is diminishing returns on the amount of science you get. Uh, so yeah, we deployed two lots of experiments. Um, and I think that should generate us some science. But most of the science from this mission is going to be coming from the actual reports we get. And the uh, research that our science lab in orbit does on them. You can see here, yeah, uh, <laughs> I wasn't kidding about the spacecraft having just enough Delta V to do this mission. We literally ran out of fuel right at the end of our suicide burn there. And I was quite proud of the fact that I, I'm doing... Well, we have a couple more suicide buttons later on in the episode, but I'm doing all of this without the aid of Kerbal Engineer. A few of you have asked me why, or asked me why um, I didn't reinstall that. I did have it at the end of last series. And it's mainly because I only really installed it just to have orbit information without having to go to the map view, but you can get that in the stock game now, in the bottom left. Um, so there's really no need for me to have Kerbal Engineer and the rest of the information it gives you like the suicide burn times and Delta V Well, I mean first of all, we also get Delta V readouts now <laughs> So I didn't need it for that either um, And then the rest of the information it gives you I don't know it feels a little bit it's a little bit cheaty It makes the game a little bit too easy. Uh, it's it's quite a bit of fun trying to judge the uh, <laughs> Suicide burn times um, Ourselves and if you're wondering suicide burn is when you literally burn your engine at the last second just to slow down before you touch the surface which is extremely dangerous but also the by far the most efficient way to land and with the amount of delta v that this spacecraft has it's uh, what we're having to do you see we actually make another one here and we slam into the ground a little hard but the 
these uh, heavy landing gear can take quite a beating. We do flip over, but we manage to flip the spacecraft back up again. I'm very surprised that those radiators uh, didn't smash. We did learn our lesson and actually fold them back in before launching the next time. Now you see here, we're actually landing back in a biome that we already landed in once before. And that's because we didn't quite have enough Delta V to go all the way around to the final biome, uh, which is Malice's middle crater. So what we had to do is go halfway there, refuel, and then uh, continue hopping. And hop a second time to get to our target biome. The rest of the biomes are all sort of height specific. And then there's just this one major crater, um, which has its own biome. And I'm pretty sure this middle crater, this is actually the site of where Minmus smashed into Malice. You can see there by the coloring of the mountains around it, uh, that's almost certainly what happened. So we should hopefully get some rather interesting readings from this particular landing site. And once again, suicide burn. Oh, look at that one. I was really proud of that one. I mean, less proud of the little engine. <laughs> spurt right at the end which sent us back up into the air you see what i mean about the minimum thrust level of this uh, of this rocket you have to um be it has to have a certain level of thrust it's not fully throttleable it can only go down to about 60 percent of its max thrust um, which does make the landing a little bit more exciting let's say and we're just going to put on the plaque to this one farewell malice it's been a fun time we fuel up our lander for the final time. We'll almost fill it up. The sun starts going down, so we uh, start to run out of electrical power. We should have put more uh, solar panels on this because we don't actually have enough power to power all of our drills. Uh, we were only powering about four of the uh, individual drill heads at any one time there out of a total of six but uh, it's fine it's worked for our purposes and this mission has been an unmitigated success not gonna lie I, I i do love it when i plan a mission so far in advance and all the different elements really do just start coming together i mean we managed to land the mobile base just fine and this a whole malice mission i was a little worried that it wouldn't quite have enough delta v or it would make things extremely difficult but it seemed to just about have the perfect amount of delta v to carry out this mission so i'm really very happy with how it's turned out and uh, it's of course given our three kerbals down there quite a bit more experience so a few people have asked why i'm going back to somewhere i've already been I mean, first of all we've already got a mission en route to reaper that's a new name for uh, jewel and also we didn't finish our mission around the wasteland we wanted to land on malice but we destroyed the lander on <laughs> ascent from the wasteland and we didn't explore all of the biomes so there's still a lot of science to get here and i wanted to have landed on pretty much everybody um in this solar system and also i mean it's interesting isn't it just to go back to uh, the changed face of kerbin and uh, yeah, it allowed us a few interesting sort of uh, things to do, especially considering that the wasteland has an atmosphere with oxygen in it, which certainly makes our SSTO design much easier. And it has a moon covered in alumina, allowing us to do this mission profile. But you can see there, now we've filled the lab with even more data. We're producing almost 100 science per day, which is just almost atrocious. But uh, in the next episode, we will be descending in our SSTO down to the surface of the wasteland, crewing our mobile our base Akira and we will be exploring the ruins of the Kerbal Space Center once more and all the various biomes of the wasteland. Thank you very much for watching everyone. I've been the Beta Penguin and I will see you all next time.